Florida. We're happy for those that are watching us online and uh, hope that your weather is uh, good. We're experiencing rain here in Central Florida uh, today. We're glad that you're here and if you happen to be watching us and living in the local area, we would like to cordially invite you to come and be a part of our congregation here. Our prayer is that after the service today that you will be closer to the Lord, that you will feel his comforting hand, and you will sense his spirit throughout the week. Let us begin our service with the gathering of God's tithes and his special offerings. <laughs> Thank you. 
First, a uh, note of thanks for all of you that uh, prayed for me Tuesday morning. Uh, as you can hear, my voice is just about back to 100%. Uh, the doctor said that it would take uh, up to two weeks, but uh, in that I have no patience, uh, I've tried to hurry it up a little bit and have tried not to talk, uh, but that hasn't worked either. So uh, anyway, thank you for your prayers. We certainly felt them. And the, uh, according to the doctor, the uh, surgery was 100% effective. And uh, we appreciate him and especially you and all of your prayers. The psalm that I have selected this morning for our prayer is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, or sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let us pray. Good morning, our most gracious Lord, our Savior, our Holy Comforter. We come to you on this day of Holy Communion, this day of the Lord's Supper, this day of the Holy Eucharist, to self-examine our hearts, our behavior, and our attitudes. Separate us from those who would do us harm and place us by a stream of your living waters. Make us prosperous, not with worldly riches, but with out of this world, but rather with your wisdom and godly knowledge. Keep us on your path of righteousness, not through our own deeds, but through your grace and your mercy. We do welcome your reproving and your rebuking, if it is gentle enough to put us back on that narrow road. We do pray and lift up for all of those that are ill in the hospital, those that are homebound, those that have to work today. Tell the people that are able to treat them, the doctors, the nurses, that treat our physical bodies. We pray for those that protect us from harm, those first responders. We pray for our men and women and our children and our grandchildren who are serving in the military. And this day we pray for our country that seems in some ways to have lost her ways. We lift up all of the Christian churches and their pastors throughout the world. For it is in your son Jesus' name that we do pray. Our yes, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
Those on, I can't. I can't see faces, Aww. and I want to be able to see the scowls, <laughs> Richard, and the smiles. 
and count the wrinkles on the forehead. <laughs> I'm going to uh, do something that I don't think I've maybe done but once or twice in my ministry, and that is that uh, I'm going to be using a different translation. Before any of you panic and fall out of your seats and start yelling blasphemy, I have checked the scripture word for word to make sure that there's no deviation, that there's no leaving out of important words. And so, uh, but it does make it a little easier to understand. I have read through the King James Version of our scripture several times this week, along with this uh, newer translation, just to make sure that uh, we're not being misled or we're are able to understand all the words that are being said. So that takes us to the Old Testament, the fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah. Remember Isaiah is the one that prophesied the coming of Jesus and named uh, right down to the minute, uh, the city and the time and where he would be born and the star and all of those very important uh, features. Fifth chapter of Isaiah. I would like to read the whole chapter, but I'm not going to, much to your relief. <laughs> but I will read till I think it's time we can cut off. This is, it begins with a song, with a tune. And it's talking about the people of Israel, talking about when they are in captivity talking about some of the problems that God is having with them and some of the things that God is telling them that he has done for them in the past. So listen to these words. Now I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard, that is Israel. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. Obviously he's describing a farmland that is producing some good crops. He plowed the land, he cleared its stones, and he planted it with the best vines. In the middle he built a watch tower, or a lighthouse, and carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. This is God and how he is preparing the promised land and how he prepared it for the Israelites before they came into the promised land. Now he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. Now you people of Jerusalem and Judah, you judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard? God is telling the people, what more can I have done for y'all? I did everything. I gave you a good land. I gave you good water. I gave you good uh, uh, trees. I gave you good plants. Gave you a good vineyard. Gave you something to press the grapes in. Gave you good weather. And he's getting ready to tell them, but what have you done for me in return? What have I already done that I couldn't have done more. When I expected sweet grapes, he's talking about the people. Why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? Now let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will tear down its hedges and let it be destroyed. I will break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed, a place overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to drop no rain on it. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heavens. He's now explaining what we've talked about so far. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. 
He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. And let me skip up to verse 19. They even mock God and say, hurry up and do something. We want to see what you can do. Talking about the plight and the burden and they were under oppression and they were in captivity. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out his plan for we want to know what it is sitting around waiting on God to do something. What sorrow, verse 20, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine, those that think they can drink all they can and boast about all of the alcohol that they can hold. Well, we've seen people that have more than what they can hold. They take bribes to let the wicked go free and they punish the innocent. Almost sounds like today's newspaper, doesn't it? <laughs> Listen to these songs that have come from popular tunes through the years. And I want you to listen to the titles and then at the end I'm going to ask you, what do you think they have in common? Can't Smile Without You by Barry Manley. <laughs> Tragedy by the Bee Gees, one of my favorite groups. <laughs> Fire and Rain by James Taylor. Rocket Man by Elton John. No, I don't like him. <laughs> Piano Man by Billy Joel. You're So Vain by Chicago. One of my favorite, our favorite groups. What do they have in common? They're all sad songs. <laughs> They're all filled with melancholy with grief, with betrayal, with heartache, with depression. In these songs, there's no peppy rhythm. One can be in a good mood, and if you listen to the words and listen to these songs, you can become a little down, a little depressed. Many times what we sing or what we whistle or what we hum can be an indicator of how and what we're feeling at the moment. A funeral dirge can be easily distinguished between hail, hail, the gang's all here and happy birthday to you. The Israelites were and still to this day are famous for their singing and their dancing. When in captivity in Babylon, they were asked to sing and their response was in Psalm 137. Four, and that says, how are we to sing a new song in a strange land? It is, and rightfully so, difficult to sing a happy song in the midst of war, in the middle of death, being held captive. We may not be able to sing a, a new song in difficult times, but we can be assured that God is always present and always loves us, even when we are falling away from his will in our lives. Love is the foundation, the nature and the character of God that never deviates or wanders from his divine purpose. However, there is wrathful judgment in a response when his people do not attempt to live and follow the righteous life that he's laid out before them. When God is silent, it does not mean that he is absent. Psalms 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength. Sometimes God may be silent, and this may not be theologically correct, but I think it puts God and us in relationship and in perspective. 
Sometimes God may be silent when he's busy doing something for us. He may be silent when he is intervening for us in a situation or in a circumstance. God may be silent in our lives when he's getting some things lined up that will be in our favor. Sometimes God is silent when he is making arrangements. So how do we know that surely the presence of the Lord is in this place? Well, the whole fifth chapter that we're looking at is the story of the Jews going against God's love and his will for them. And then we see the results of what happens if we do fall from his favor, falling from his grace. Again, how are we to not experience what God's children are going through in this story? While we in our own country, our own nation, are beginning to see some of the same indicators that these Israelites were going through while being held captive. That is, how do we worship the Lord in a way that will please Him, not us? Would it be falling, people falling out in the spirit and falling down on the floor and passing out and, and shaking uncontrollably? Is that a way that God is pleased? I don't know. Or maybe we can please God by speaking in an unknown tongue that nobody around us understands what's going on. Is that a way that we can say surely the presence of the Lord is in this place? Maybe we can sing the same song 27 times and sing the chorus more times over and over and over again. Can we then say surely the presence of the Lord is in this place? Or maybe we can read 10 pages of ritual and have fancy robes and fancy stoles and altar cloths. Or can we say that surely the presence of the Lord is in this place? When the pastor is finished preaching, he's standing on one of his breeches legs and shirt tail hanging out and he's foaming at the mouth. Then the newest church is what we know and hear as the seeker church. A church that is not necessarily designed to please God, but rather to attract people of the world. And they do it by becoming more like the world than they do becoming more like God's church. And they sing songs that are attractive to teenagers and to young people and to the unchurched. And their design is that when you walk into their auditorium, into their building, that you are not intimidated, but rather you immediately feel comfortable and at home. I don't want to feel that way when I walk into God's sanctuary. I want to feel a little intimidated. I want to feel a little out of place. I want to feel like that when I walk into God's sanctuary, that there's something in there bigger than me. Sometimes when a preacher gets louder and repeats a lot, it just means that he's run out of something to say. None of what that I've listed will bring us into favor with God. What brings us into favor with God is if God's word is present. And if God's words are present, then God is present. Many times God's word offends us, makes us uncomfortable and can even at times make us angry. Such are some of the verses from our scripture this day. Hogo said it many years ago in the funny paper. He said, we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. Our nation is in a crisis. And if you find that hard to believe or hard to accept, maybe you need to have your eyes and your ears checked. With all that you see and you hear, what do you suppose 
that I, as your pastor, preach? Should we close all of the doors, lock them, pretend that our faith has no part in addressing with what's going on in this world today? Well, that's obviously what we've been doing. For now we have come to the point where the church has little, if any, impact upon this world. That is exactly why the world is in some of the troubles that is in. It's pastors, seminaries, theologians, for the most part, have mounted their lofty pulpits and with an air of arrogance and self-righteous proclaim. I will never address current events from a Christian perspective. Well, how has that worked out? Churches, pastors, even in my own lifetime, now that I've reached the ripe old age of 41, <laughs> churches and pastors used to be at the front of society leading society in a godly way. I remember when, how proud I was at a football game when our pastor at our local church was called on to have the prayer before the football game. And I remember looking over at a friend of mine who went to a different church, and I said, that's my preacher. Or having devotions at a county council meeting. We're speaking at civic get-togethers, being chaplains in the military, police, and fire department. Now it would seem that we hang our feeble heads and cowardly beg for permission to whisper a prayer that none of our words would offend or upset. Tell that to Billy Sunday, John Cowan, John Wesley, or maybe Jonathan Edwards as he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. Our churches are in turmoil like never before. There is more than enough evidence to support the fact that our churches were strongest when they were not making compromises or bending scripture, or taking out of context. Where is the church on abortion? Where is the church on gender change? Where is the church on sexual perversions? Where is the church on stealing? Where is the church on any subject that the Congress addresses? There was a time that you didn't have to ask about how the church stood. Right and wrong were taught. Now it has become just irrelevant. Good and evil were identified. God and anti-God were known, and truth and heresy were easily distinguishable. In my intellectual deficits, I can't determine if the church is following the world or if the world is following the church. With so many of the mainline churches splitting, it would seem that on the liberal side there seems to be no boundaries, no parameters, no perimeters for behavior. With some of the modern theologies, there is no sin. At most, there's just unacceptable social behavior. In modern theology, there is no word for abomination. That word is offensive. It would seem that some read what are abominations and take those abominations and turn them into denominations. A little sarcastic, but I think has truth. No longer are many of our elected officials and appointed bureaucrats held accountable to anyone but their own opinions. And the great words of our forefathers and foremothers are discarded as foolishness 
of the weak-minded. So-called religious leaders are taking God's word out of context and, and living wild and lascivious lives. Don't know if you've heard of the great evangelist by the name of T.D. Jakes that toured and has his own mega church. And for the last 10 years, people have looked up to him and he's written books. And from the very beginning, most of us conservative pastors with discernment had questions about his theology and his lifestyle. It has recently been documented now that Pastor Manning, a pastor, an investigator pastor, has exposed Reverend Jake's involvement in a sex scandal, you can Google this, involving multiple partners, including male prostitutes, and rapper Puff Daddy. Just a few years ago, there was a local pastor and had a church that was not much bigger than the one that I'm pastoring currently. And one of his heroes was T.D. Jakes. And so he called T.D. Jakes PR man and said, we'd like to have him come to our church. And PR man said that would be great, but I want you to know that right up front we need a $10,000 check. <laughs> so this young pastor went back to his people and he had an offering and said that if we raise enough money, we can have T.D. Jakes come and preach for us. The offering was not high enough, so he took another offering to the point where he ended up fleecing his entire congregation until there was no money. Well, they were able by some means to raise the $10,000. T.D. Jakes flew in at the nearest airport on his private jet, showed up at this little church about the size of ours, went in and preached for 40 minutes, turned around and left and never shook the first hand, including the pastor and got on his jet and went to his next stop. It's been documented that these sex parties took place at Puff Daddy's house in what is called a freak room where there were porn stars and some other stuff, but I'm not going to read that garbage. Mm -hmm. See, that's what happens when pastors are not accountable to the people. <laughs> there was once a lady who told me, Preacher, don't be too hard on me. I'm just doing what comes naturally. <laughs> Have you ever heard a more blatant confession? <laughs> We're called to go beyond our nature, aren't we? Our government is doing just what comes naturally with greed and power, control and lying, and just not our government, but governments throughout the world. Many in the church are doing the same, what comes naturally, and then attempting to justify it. We have, a ray of, we have arrived at the age of no accountability, in ancient Rome, there was a tradition, and that is that when an engineer, or they, they called them engineers, not architects back then, when they would uh, build an arch, when they would get to the very last stone, which is called the keystone, and they were getting ready to take all the scaffolds away, that the, tra that the tradition was that the engineer of that project would stand underneath that arch. <laughs> and when they took all of the scaffolding away, he would still be under that arch. Now that, my friends, is accountability. <laughs> that is accountability. Almost every major doctrine edict of the Christian faith has become neutralized. How are we to sing a new song in a strange land? We used to say that our forefathers and our foremothers of our country would roll over their grave and not recognize our nation today. Well, I think we can go one beyond that. I don't recognize 
what's going on in our country today. Everything could be falling apart, it would seem. There was once a story of a humongous fire in Texas where there was a great oil, dairy oil well. Couldn't put it out and they called all of the modern fire departments in the territory and they could only get so close to the fire and they had to back off and just confess there's no way we can put that fire out. All of a sudden, all of these modern fire trucks looked behind them and came speeding up a little volunteer fire department in a beat up old fire truck. Ladders flying every which way, guys hanging on to the rails as tight as they could. Came flying, just went right by all those modern fire engines, went right up to the fire, put it out. Well, by that time, all of the news were out there with the cameras and the commentators and they went to interview the chief of this little volunteer fire department. And they said, the oil company has given you a million dollars for putting that fire out. Now, what's the first thing you're gonna do with that million dollars? The chief of that little volunteer fire department said, the first thing we're gonna do is get a new set of brakes for that fire truck. <laughs> <laughs> That is accountability. Almost every major doctrine has become neutralized. We need to put the brakes on. We need a new set of brakes for our world. We need a new set of brakes for our country. We need a new set of brakes for our government. In many instances, we need a new set of bricks for our church. President Truman made the quote, the book stops here. Who wrote the memo that authorized every illegal crossing of the border gets $1,800, and I verified this, gets a free cell phone, food, and a plane, train, or bus ticket to anywhere they want to go? Who wrote that memo? Who wrote the policy that young school children can go to a doctor without their parents' knowledge and begin to change gender with gender-changing drugs? But excuse me, I'm sorry, and I apologize profusely. As a Christian, what business is that of mine? It is my business. That is my business is to address ungodliness in this world and to present the love, the salvation, and the redemption of his Son and our Lord and to address all that is deviant. A person who uh, worships with us online I think they're in New York. I'm not going to read all this email. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. But he, so let me tell you. My wife is sick with COVID. The doctor sent in a prescription, but the pharmacy said, and gives a few choice words. The <laughs> pharmacy said, blank, blank, that the insurance company will cover this particular drug only once every six months. This is so pitifully wrong. If you have no insurance, it's free. I offered to pay out of pocket, but it would have been $1,500. If you are illegal, it is also free. How American is this? How Christian is this? Preacher, just keep politics out of the pulpit. I'm trying. <laughs> Hurriedly. We have three points and they're very short. First in our story, the fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah, the Lord prepared the land that his people occupied. He planned it before they got there. But they let their guard down, they opened up their borders, they accepted idols and they intermarried with the enemies and then became prisoners 
That's the story. Read it. I believe that God prepared this land that we know as the United States. I believe that he prepared it before we got here. I believe that he prepared a lighthouse, a land where the principles, values, and the ethics of the gospel of Jesus Christ could be preached and spread over the whole world. At one time, our nation was sending missionaries throughout all the world. Now the place that we need the most missionaries is right here in our own land. God, through devout men and women, gave us logical, common sense laws and rules to live by. And if we didn't, there would be consequences. So where are we presently? The president of a great Ivy League university can't even write her own thesis, but plagiarized. And you would think that her doctor's degree would be removed. But she is still called doctor and still remains on tenure at that university with lifetime pay. Friends, it normally takes someone about a year to write their doctoral thesis. It took me three. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was busy doing other things. <laughs> but it bothers me that somebody can do it without working. When I know what I had to go through. Candidates for the Supreme Court, when asked, can you tell me what a woman is? They can't. They can't. Well, I'll tell you what. When a new girl came into our class in the seventh grade and sat right behind me, and her name was Mary, I knew she was a girl. <laughs> and I was just entering puberty. And I certainly knew the difference way back in the seventh grade, the difference between a boy and a girl. <laughs> Secondly, the Bible says that God supplied a wine press. He did this in the vineyard of the promised land so that the land could be productive. With hard work, organization, planning, the land and the people could be blessed. God, I believe, has done the same thing for our land. He's given us fossil fuel. He's given us fertile land. He's given us wood. But some don't want any of it cut down. Tree huggers. So thick, some of the forest right on our own Highway 92 going to Daytona that a skinny cat couldn't walk through. <laughs> and if there's ever a fire, the whole place will burn down to the ground because they're afraid of thinning out the forest. God gave us animals, but there are those on the squad who tell us that they're polluting land with their natural gases. <laughs> they want us to eat bugs plant food. Now at this point in time, I believe that God is seeking, is seeking accountability just like he did with the Israelites. He went looking for good fruit from Israel. He had found it, blessed, and protected it. He's done the very same thing for us as a country. God has poured riches upon riches on us. And we've taken many of his gifts, buried them, and made hills of dung. We've taken down, destroyed, decimated, and desecrated almost all presence of God's blessings in our country. I promise you, God is watching us. God is watching us. He's watching our leaders. He's watching me. Watching you. What will we say, what we will do when there's nothing left, no freedoms, no security, or that can't happen to a preacher? Ask Cuba, ask Venezuela, ask Germany in World War II, ask Yugoslavia, ask Czechoslovakia, ask Russia, ask China, ask Korea. If I preached this sermon in any of these places, I would be shocked. What God has given us, we must protect, even with our lives, even with our brains and our intellect. We must be warned, as I promised, that the hedge of protection will be removed, as it was in the time of Isaiah. Strangers will invade, as it talks about in Isaiah. 
destroy our culture, rob and pilfer, and propagandize our youth. There will be no rain. We see now how many states in the West are fighting over water rights. Some in Michigan cannot even drink water out of their tap. Well, this has certainly been a sad song, depressing. The truth is, as a nation and as a church, we must turn around and we must repent. We must listen to the words of our Lord, or we, like the Israelites, will end up in captivity. We can already begin to see the start of that. The hedges and borders all around the promised land will rot and die. We'll lose any sovereignty that we once had, and criminals and cartels, child molesters, sex trafficking will flood our nation and our church. You ever hear of the group, The Animals? <laughs> one, one of their uh, songs that I liked was, uh, and I'll just do the chorus in the first verse. The chorus says, we got to get out of this place. I almost want to sing. <laughs> if it's the last thing that we ever do, we got to get out of this place because, girl, there's a better life for me and you. In this dirty old part of the city where the sun refused to shine, people tell me there ain't no use to trying. we got to get out of this place. <laughs> you want to see it? i got the whole song. <laughs> God is, God has a few patience, but I think he's at the end of his patience. Like he gave the Jews, what more could he have done for us? He gave us his only son for a savior. He gives us promises of comfort. He gives us his word for guidance. He gives us his spirit for companionship. He gives us his church for fellowship. He's given us the promise of heaven. He's given us everything that we need and more. Let's not bury our faith. I gotta stop, but I want to end with one illustration. There was once a man who either inherited or bought many famous violins. Stradivariuses, Nicholas, Amante, Leopold, and others. But he never played them. He took all of those valuable famous violins and locked them in a room for nobody to ever see or play. At the end of his life and when he died, his children inherited those violins and they unlocked the door for the first time in many years and they walked in and guess what they saw? All of those violins were rotted. The wood had dried up. The strings had broke. And they were worth nothing. There's a story about that in the Bible. It's called when God gives us gifts and we bury them and don't use them properly. The best thing I heard, I don't know, I don't play the piano, but I, I've heard that after it's tuned, the best thing that you can do to keep it in tune is keep playing. If you don't play it, it goes out of tune. I think the same thing is true with us Christians. We've just gone to sleep and nobody's playing us. Or well, maybe they have and we've gone to sleep. Might be time for us to wake up and put a coat of varnish on our violins, restring them, and go out into all the world and sing a new song. You do not have to be a member of the church to in order to uh, receive the sacrament all you have to do is believe that jesus is the son of god and that god the father sent him here to save us from our sins and that's the only requirement let us pray father we ask now that these elements be used for your sanctification and for your glory and that as we receive these a part of your blood and a part of your body that as we leave this service we will go into your service. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>
Well, the bad news is we ran out of communion. <laughs> the good news is we ran out of communion. <laughs> Does everybody except the pastor have one? <laughs> That's all right. For those of you at home and for those of you here now, if you will take a, a symbol of the body of Christ, break and eat, and take this a symbol of his blood and drink. And as you eat and as you drink, do this in remembrance of him. Father, we do ask now that this sacrament be to your glory and to your edification. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Let's lift our voices together, 422. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, verse 1. Thank you. 